Um, hi, everyone. My name is Veena Ramani. I'm your moderator for today's webinar and the Senior Program Director at Ceres for our Capital Market Systems team. I'm also the author of Ceres' newly released report addressing climate as a systemic risk, a call to action for U.S. financial regulators. Ceres is a sustainability nonprofit working with influential companies and investors from around the world on a host of global sustainability challenges, including water risk, the climate crisis, and deforestation. I'd like to start today by saying that our hearts go out to all those affected by the three vast and interconnected systemic challenges that we're facing. We are, of course, continuing to deal with the global pandemic, and we continue to be extremely grateful for those on the front lines who are risking so much and working so hard to ensure that we all stay, stay healthy and safe. We also want to recognize the pain being inflicted throughout our society because of systemic racism that exists and is manifested in so many ways. And finally, all of us continue to be affected by the climate crisis. We've all seen pictures from the horrific wildfires out west. We're also dealing with a hyperactive hurricane season with Hurricane Sally threatening Louisiana, Alabama, and Mississippi. We hope that the current discussion about climate change and discussions about climate change happening in so many places will lead to real and systemic changes, including in our financial markets. Before we begin with today's discussion, I have a few housekeeping notes. Please note that the session is being recorded. We will be providing all participants with a link to the recording shortly after its completion. If you have any questions, please enter them in the chat box that's located on your control panel. As you can see, we have close to 500 people who, who are hoping, planning to attend today's session. So we will be keeping everyone on mute um, and questions should be fed to us through the control panel. There is a potential due to global bandwidth issues that we may experience some technical challenges. Unfortunately, this is beyond our control. If this does happen, the discussion will pause for 30 seconds to allow for the bandwidth to adjust. <laughs> Please, we thank you ahead of time for your patience in the event that such an issue arises. The goal of our webinar today is to discuss the recent and sweeping report from the Climate Change Subcommittee of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, the CFTC, titled Managing Climate Risks in the U.S. Financial System. Released just last week, this is a groundbreaking report that affirms the systemic nature of climate change risks and calls on financial regulators to act. We are truly honored to have a distinguished panel of guests today to discuss this important report. Commissioner Rustin Benham was unanimously confirmed by the Senate as a commissioner of the U.S. CFTC in 2017 and was sworn in um, for a term expiring in 2021. Prior to joining the CFTC, Mr. Benham served as senior counsel to U.S. Senator Debbie Stabenow of Michigan from 2011 to 2017, focusing on policy and legislation relating to the CFTC and the Department of Agriculture. Prior to serving with Senator Stabenow, Mr. Benham practiced law in New York City and worked at the New Jersey Office of the Attorney General. Bob Litterman is the chairman of the Risk Committee of Kipos Capital. Prior to joining Kipos in 2010, Bob enjoyed a 23-year career at Goldman Sachs. Bob was named a partner of Goldman Sachs in 1994 and became the head of the firm-wide risk function. He is the co-developer of the Black Litterman Global Asset Allocation Model. Bob currently serves as the chair of the CFTC's Market Risk Subcommittee and was the driving force behind this report. Mindy Luba is the CEO of Ceres, where she has been at the helm since 2003. As a well-known global thought leader, Mindy has inspired coalitions of investors, boards, C-suite executives, and capital market leaders to factor sustainability risks and opportunities into decision-making. Prior to Ceres, Mindy served as the regional administrator at the US EPA under former President Bill Clinton. She also founded Green Century Capital Management and served as the director of the Massachusetts Public Interest Research Group. Mindy was a part of the climate change subcommittee of the CFTC that worked on this report. Our plan is to begin the webinar with some questions for our panelists and then make sure that we have 10 to 15 minutes towards the end to reserve for audience Q&A. So Commissioner, let's begin with you. Could you provide us with some context as to how this report came to be at all? What was your vision behind creating this subcommittee? Sure, thanks, Vina, and hello to everyone who's able to join us today. Um, Vina, thanks for those opening remarks. Appreciate them and certainly support them, and um, also want to recognize and thank 
um, series for hosting the event. And, and Mindy, of course, as you mentioned, she was a part of the committee, um, an integral part of the committee. And um, as I'll discuss in a little bit, we had 34 members, everyone played their part, but certainly having series a part of the conversation and contributing um, a lot of the work that they've been speaking about and you've been advocating for a number of years was was really, really important to the uh, the, the entire effort. Um, so when I think about how we got here today, it's been it's been a long road. Certainly, um, it, it feels like uh, years and years. But um, you mentioned I had worked in the Senate for a number of years before joining the Commission in 2017, working both on CFTC policy and also um, agricultural policy. So the idea of climate change really is um, certainly not new to me. Not something that um, I, I just started thinking about. Uh, and I, I often thought about it within the context of agriculture and, and climate, which, you know, uh, farmers and ranchers, climate is the number one uh, challenge they face on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's something that is uh, top of mind in terms of risk management for uh, the grower community, both in the U.S. and across the globe. When I got to the CFTC, obviously focused on my day-to-day my -day job as a commissioner and, and sort of fulfilling the mandate that we have at the commission, overseeing the derivatives market, which is you know, obviously extremely important, a global regulator and one that has taken on new prominence and importance since the financial crisis and, and Dodd-Frank uh, after 2010. Um, but we have these unique um, opportunities within the commission to sort of oversee and, and champion issues that we care about, I think, within the commission uh, through these functions that are, are called advisory committees, which you mentioned. So as I began my time at the CFTC in 2017 and into 2018, um, I really started to put together a larger puzzle uh, based on what I had done professionally in the Senate, what I cared about on a personal level and in my current responsibilities uh, as a commissioner at the CFTC and, and thinking about um, what a, a lot of work had been done overseas going back to 2015 by international regulators, certainly by the private sector. I really thought it was important um, that a U.S. regulator step up and start to discuss and think about climate risk uh, within the context of financial markets, um, obviously the economy as a byproduct, uh, and what we need to do as a community of regulators and stakeholders and private sector participants to build a more resilient um, financial system. Um, unfortunately, and I say this often, the proof is really out there on a day-to-day -day basis. And you know, when I started this effort in 2018, we obviously had been recovering from a lot of uh, intense wildfires in the West, record flooding in the Midwest, and you know, record um, years uh, really back to back to back in terms of uh, global temperatures uh, across the world. And unfortunately today, as you mentioned in your opening remarks, we continue to face these challenges in more extreme and more frequent ways, um, thinking about the wildfires out West, um, in a more intense and more frequent hurricane season um, that's upon us now and longer periods of time that we're having to deal with this. So as much as this was a part of my responsibility as a financial regulator, it really is about seeing what's going on in the world on a day-to-day -day basis and having to address these issues. And really with the economy, with you know human health, with the environment, the underpinning of all of these issues is really, in my mind, uh, often buried in financial markets, um, whether it's through credit or risk management, uh, it is just absolutely critical to build resilient, um, safe, and sound financial institutions so that when we come across these crises, which unfortunately we are in one right now with, pan with a pandemic, uh, we are ensured and feel safe that the um, financial system and the institutions that make it up are resilient and safe. So <clears throat> thinking about all that effort and, and what I could do as a commissioner, I really started to kick off the effort uh, and think about putting um, a lot of my mind towards uh, convening a group of people within the subcommittee and trying to put a report together that would really discuss and dissect at a very, very granular level uh, climate risk within the context of financial markets. Uh, great, thank you so much for that context, Commissioner. And and what was your vision as to what this um, subcommittee would achieve? And and you know, does what has happened sort of accord with at least your the twinkle in your eye when you started off down this road? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I without a doubt, this has far exceeded expectations. Um, I had a big vision for it, and I had big plans, and I knew it would be a challenge, um, certainly in this environment. But um, knowing the work that's been done, I think across the private sector and, and across the globe, I thought. Um, it was too important to to not um, try, to not go after, and um, really putting together the right people, I thought, was the first and most important step uh, in achieving this goal. 
So, you know, for those who don't know, and I think I mentioned this earlier, we had a 34 member panel and, you know, having been in DC for about 10 years now, the number one lesson is all, all about building coalitions and building a diverse, strong coalitions um, from across uh, the spectrum. And within the context of financial markets and financial market stakeholders, really that's, that's a huge part of the economy. And if you think about, and I, if you look at the membership um, uh, of the subcommittee, we really cover every part of the economy from large financial institutions, banks, both domestic and international, large institutional asset managers. We have representatives from agriculture, from the energy sector, um, exchanges, intermediaries, data providers. We have academics, public interest. Um, so a number and environmental groups as well. So when you think about a coalition like that, I think it becomes really difficult. And this is my hope, and this was my plan. Um, it becomes really difficult to sort of rebut or oppose the findings and the conclusions of the committee because it really transcends, I think, party lines, it transcends geographies of the states, um, and it really becomes a defensible document um, on, on many fronts that I think uh, has merit and has a lot of credibility to it. And let me just say a few words about Bob, who will speak shortly. You know, um, I, I've run a couple of these advisory committees. Obviously, I've been around DC long enough to understand the function of, of government and how we have to advocate and raise awareness for any number of issues, but the chair becomes a critical part, right? 34 member committee is a huge group um, by an advisory committee standard. This issue is very difficult. It's obviously political in nature, but also very substantive uh, and, and sort of a real world issue that companies and, and institutions and uh, human beings have to face with and deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So, you know, thinking about the first conversations I've had with Bob back, you know, over a year ago, his experience, which you highlighted a few of his, um, uh, his accomplishments professionally, whether it's his days at Goldman as a risk manager and as a you know world-renowned asset manager, but then since at Kepos and the focus he's really lasered in on climate change, and, um, his credibility, his his experience, and his his expertise really became the perfect mix of uh, of a chair to lead the committee to demand respect, obviously, but also to sort of have a vision for what a report would look like what policies would be shaped and considered and ultimately what the outcome would be. So certainly a huge debt of gratitude to Bob, um, but I know he cares about this deeply and he's passionate about it. And um, in the conversations we certainly have had since last Wednesday, he's very pleased with the outcome as well. So, um, you know, just to circle back, this has far exceeded expectation and I know there's a lot of work to be done, um, but it's also not surprising because I think I laid the right groundwork and the strategy was sound um, and the issue is real. And we're dealing with it on a day-to-day -day basis uh, across the country, and it's going to affect our economy. It is it is affecting our economy and our financial markets, and we really need, I think, domestically within the U.S. to step up and start to be a part of the larger conversation, because this is not a, a you know this is not a U.S. problem alone. In order to address it, we have to work with our international partners, um, and really start to approach this in a much different way. Oh, well, great! Thank you, Commissioner. And Bob, I think Commissioner Bennett has given you a, a fantastic setup right here. So again, as the chair of this climate change subcommittee, clearly that you were responsible in driving report content creation. Could you run us through, and this is an unfair question to ask, maybe uh, highlight um, what you see as the, the report recommendations? Thank you, Veena. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you, uh, Commissioner Bennett, for those uh, kind remarks. Uh, this report for me was uh, it, it was a, uh, a fantastic opportunity and an honor to chair the committee. It was a terrific group of individuals, as the chairman, uh, I mean, as, as, as Commissioner Benham uh, mentioned, it, it really reflects a broad cross section of the uh, participants in the financial markets and the ability to gain a consensus on this uh, very important topic. I think makes our recommendations very powerful. First recommendation that I want to focus on is uh, recommendation one, which is that we need to put a price on carbon. Uh, the participants in the subcommittee all recognize from the outset that we can't uh, direct capital in the right directions on our own. Capital in the financial markets flows in the direction that the incentives provide. And in order for us to direct capital toward the appropriate, uh, you know, low carbon uh, capital and uh, infrastructure that we need, 
we have to have the right incentives. So I thought that was very important. And that provides the context for the rest of the report. Then we look at what the uh, various risks are, what needs to be done, uh, both from uh, an understanding of the issue as well as disclosure from corporations, also looking at it from the investors' perspective, what's the information that investors need, uh, what's the role of the regulators, and it's a complex regulatory system that we have in the U.S. So we look not just at the role of the CFTC, but also and I think this is an important strength of our analysis. We look at the entire regulatory authorities in the U.S. and how they interact, frankly, with regulatory authorities around the world, because this is a global problem. Uh, we also look at the role of uh, the, the corporations in terms of disclosure and uh, the information that's needed by investment managers as well as asset owners. And, uh, and then we, uh, we focus on what's needed to allow the uh, flow of capital to increase as is needed. Right now, uh, capital flowing into the, uh, the low carbon economy is a, a small fraction of what we need. So uh, we have to move quickly. That was also an important part of the report, the fact that there is a degree of urgency that's absolutely necessary. We also looked at were there additional authorities that are required by the regulators. And we found that no, in fact, the regulators have the authority they need. It's just a question of uh, focusing on climate related risks. So, uh, you know, there's 53 recommendations in the report. Uh, and uh, to me, one of the things that was really very encouraging was all the different things that we agreed upon. You know, uh, Commissioner Benham asked us to be high level and suggested 50 pages is what we should shoot for. Well, it, you know, we, we ended up with much longer report. Now it was high level, but there was just so much that we agreed on that our biggest problem was trying to limit it in, in, in terms of the, uh, the length. Uh, and I, I think we did a good job. I am very pleased with the report. Uh, I, I want to call out, by the way, not only all of the members of the report who actually did the writing, uh, but also the edit editorial staff. We had three excellent editors who just went over and above the uh, expectations of the committee in terms of creating really an outstanding product. Uh, great, thanks. Great. Thanks a lot for that context, Bob. And, and and you started to get at this, but I think both you and Commissioner Benham really emphasized the, the multi-stakeholder nature of the group that participated in developing the report recommendations, including, you know, over 30, 34 participants coming from the business, investor, academic, advocacy communities, and, and the Commissioner mentioned a whole range of categories that I, I'm not even going to get it get to. So could you give us a little bit of color about the process that you went through to get this group to consensus because clearly it is that sort of consensus nature of the process that um, is so valuable and important um, to this report. Yeah, you know, it was uh, remarkably smooth, I would say. We started out and uh, in one of our early meetings, we kind of went around the table and introduced ourselves. And I remember talking about some of the fundamental questions such as the need for incentives. There was no one pushing back on that. The need for disclosure of you know, material climate risk, no, no pushback on that. And uh, so we, we kind of defined the major topics, which ended up being the work streams that created the, the chapters in the report. And uh, the, the members of the report really stepped up and uh, in, in most cases, joined one or more of those work streams and, and provided input and drafts and redrafts. Uh, we came up with, uh, you know, an initial draft that we gave to all the members of the subcommittee uh, and asked them to come back with comments. And we got nearly a thousand comments, not just from the members of the subcommittee, but from the experts in their organizations. And so I don't know how many people actually read that first draft, but boy, we got a, an awful lot of feedback, which we took in, uh, into account and uh, re revised uh, and so on. And, and through that process of iteratively going through and getting back comments, 
uh, we did identify those uh, areas where there was uh, complete consensus and those areas where there was some disagreement. And we basically pushed ourselves as far as we could go uh, in the direction of uh, agreement. And uh, where there was a little bit more discussion, we, uh, we had some uh, facilitated discussions, mostly uh, over the telephone because of the uh, pandemic, but uh, we were able to make good progress. Uh, we were very productive. And uh, eventually we, we got as far as we got, which is what you see in the report. And then we voted on it and it was unanimous. So I was, I was very pleased. That is that is truly remarkable. And again, thank you for providing us some insight into what went be, went on behind the scenes of this 126-page um, report, Bob. Really, really interesting. So, so shifting from Bob to Mindy, Mindy, it'll be great to get your sense of of what this report means to the the companies and the investors that Series works with, many of whom are on the webinar with us today. Um, you're on mute, Mindy. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm going to say one thing about the process and jump right into the substance. Um, getting to a goal and meeting with success takes vision and execution. Uh, and we have two of the most extraordinary visionaries and leaders in that process. This would not have happened uh, without Russ and without Bob. And um, I would never disagree with Bob privately or publicly, but I'm going to disagree with him right now. And that is, it was smooth. It, it wasn't not smooth, but it took extraordinary um, leadership and the ability to talk to somebody, whether it was from an oil company or a public interest group, whether it was from uh, a bank or uh, a mutual fund company, uh, somebody who could talk to any anybody and everybody and get them to yes. Uh, the other person I wanted to disagree with throughout the process, but far be it from me, is Russ. He said, not only do I want this to happen, I want it to be a consensus. I didn't know him well enough to ask him if he was smoking funny cigarettes, but a consensus amongst this group really is almost incomprehensible. So to both of our leaders, uh, thank you. So what does this report do? It fundamentally establishes something that inside players might know, but not the broader community, that climate risk is not only a compelling environmental problem and public health and human problem, but it has the ability to disrupt our entire economy. So it's not just an economic problem for the oil and gas industry or the transportation sector, whether we have combustion vehicles or electric vehicles. It literally has the ability to disrupt our economy overall. And sadly, truly sadly, and who would have known, the pandemic and the forest fires are showing us, us that in real time and in living color and not in a very human way. The pandemic has shown us that when you have a systemic shock to the system, one that we could have mitigated, not gotten rid of, it disrupts everything from human life to our resources to every sector of our economy. I live in Boston and when I walk around the streets and see the number of stores and restaurants shutting down, it doesn't matter, small, medium and large businesses, unemployment numbers impacted by this issue that has created a systemic risk, one that we've got to look at, not as it relates to one sector of the economy, but every sector of the economy, or the forest fires. They are not an accident. They are related to climate. The world is drier and warmer. Um, and we are seeing hundreds of thousands, if not millions of lives disrupted. And with every human disruption comes economic disruption. They're losing jobs, they're losing homes, they're losing their businesses. Um, with climate change, we have a shot at mitigating it. I don't think we're going to make it go away. We are too far past that. But we can make it less worse if we double down and we recognize it for both the human, planetary, and economic risk that it is to every, every sector of our economy, and we begin to act. And so many of the actions are laid out in this report. And to have the credibility of a federal agency this is not just an environmental report, but of a federal agency with some of the smartest risk people in the world. And sorry, Bob, you do get that title. Um, they are telling us, we are showing that this risk is to our entire economy and acting sooner 
at a different pace and a different scale than anything we've seen in the past in the past is what we need to be doing. Great. Um, thanks for that context, Mindy. And you just started to talk about, you know, the, the growing affirmation around the fact that that climate poses risks not only to sort of individual companies, not only to industries at large, but to financial markets at large. So could you tell us a little bit about some of the momentum that we're seeing around these issues? Um, and uh, yeah, especially around the notion that that climate change does in fact pose a systemic risk. Well, you know, on one side, on the political side and, you know, both sides of the aisle though, after we did a similar report, as some of our colleagues know, and after this report, We've seen letters from members of Congress. We've seen formal committees issuing reports. We've seen the Senate respond to this. So the pickup, we're also talking to literally hundreds of regulators at the SEC, at the Federal Reserve, people who did not talk about climate change even last summer, who are now seeing it as part of their mission, as part of their main mandate and what they need to do. We're also seeing, I mean, Bob talked about a price on carbon. In the end, company by company action and investor by investor action isn't gonna get us there at the pace and the scale. We need systemic change, as we're talking about in this report. And we need policy that applies a level playing field for everybody. Right now, carbon pollution in most parts of the world is free. So you get free, you get a lot more of it. And this happens to be not what we want more of. We need to put a price on carbon pollution. And so there's an incentive not to put those gases into the air, but to act differently and find other ways. Having this group come out calling for a price on carbon is crucial. We need the SEC to mandate disclosure of climate risk. It is a material financial risk. That is the job of the SEC. Investors need to know uh, when they're making investments, what are the risks of each, to each of the companies? Uh, this report calls for that. It says climate is a material financial risk. It doesn't explicitly say how many agencies which need to deal with it, but I can say the SEC's responsibility is to deal with climate risk, and we're seeing more interest and action there. And just today, a um, hundred, well, 450 investors who are part of Climate Action 100 Plus, a group of investors with 45 trillion dollars in assets under management who are calling on the 160 largest emitters to set goals and to change their practices on climate. And they're getting response from those companies, from Shell to BP to every sector. They announced a benchmark where now they're gonna look at every one of those companies. Are they setting goals? Are those goals real? Are they meeting their goals? So this report is pushing to the fore climate as a financial issue that we need to not only study, and we need to disclose, but we need to act on and act on sooner rather than later. Oh, great, thanks so much, Mindy. So one final question to all of you before we throw it open to audience Q&A, and this starts to relate to some of the questions that we're starting to see for in. Now that the report has been released, what do each of you see as the next step, right? What is, you know, what do you see will happen? And, and as a part of that, if you could also talk to what the audience to this webinar could do to help maintain the momentum that Mindy just talked about um, and potentially allow for the, the report recommendations to be acted on. So Commissioner, I'd love to start with you. Uh, th thanks, Vina. Before I get to that question, I wanna just react to a few things that were said and most recently by Mindy and you know disclosures and the importance of disclosures within the context of this conversation. You know, at the uh, the top of of my initial remarks, you know, I mentioned having series on board was a critical uh, part of the effort. So I do want to just you know thank Mindy again for her work specifically on the disclosure piece. I know this has been a huge um, issue and uh, something that series has focused on for a long, long time. So having her a part of that conversation really drove the debate, um, the easy debate that Bob said it was, um, but it was it was critical to have all sides of the table and serious, sincerely having series and Mindy specifically the, you know, the top leadership of the organization there was critical to moving the ball forward and getting to this, this consensus that we got. Um, and two quick other things, in, we, we, Bob mentioned the scope of the report and I've gotten this question frequently about, you know, what CFTC regulates, obviously derivatives are a key part of, of the financial ecosystem. 
Um, and I often respond to a question about the scope of the report by saying, you know, we learned in 2008 after the crisis, financial crisis, that financial markets are interconnected. It doesn't, it doesn't matter where you're investing, where you're managing risk, where, um, you know, you're raising capital. The bottom line is all financial markets are interconnected. We learned this again in the March-April period at the onset of the, the COVID pandemic. And uh, to look at this narrowly, I think, would have been careless, quite frankly. So. Uh, as Bob and I discussed, and as I laid out that vision we we talked about a little bit earlier, it was important to have a broad remit and give Bob really the authority um, to go at this um, with a big picture in mind, because in, in order to analyze it and address the risks and mitigate them appropriately, we really need to look at all financial markets. Um, and the last thing I'll say before I answer your question is the power of the financial markets, especially, you know, and this goes to Mindy's point, the investor community. Um, and incentives. Bob cares about this deeply, talks about this. This really goes to the heart of the carbon price issue. Um, how do we align incentives to get the investor community to allocate capital to places that will really both speed up the transition, but also make the trans transition as smooth as possible? So um, I really, you know, you've, you've seen it with the ESG movement, obviously, for, for many years, but um, there is pent up capital and it's important to have standardization. It's important to have a level playing field. It's important to have clarity from regulators in order for capital to flow where it needs to be. And ultimately that starts with the price on carbon and, and aligning incentives so that we can move toward this uh, in, in a more efficient manner. Finally, addressing your question, you know, there was a vacuum in, in the space. I think now this report really fills a huge, huge vacuum. Um, it is step one. That's the bottom line. I also always get this question and I understand it. People think, you know, we're going to have rules implemented next month. No, we're not. You know, I can be very frank with that. Um, but in, in building an argument and building momentum and building a process towards solutions and towards regulatory responses, you have to start with these building blocks. And unfortunately, the basic building blocks are not even there right now until now. And I think this report, given the coalition, given the strong support, given the credibility of the members, including my you know, panel co-panelists here with us today, uh, really pushes the ball forward so that when we do take action, we have something to look at. Uh, we have a report that really uh, shines light on the issues, the risks, and, and what needs to get done. Uh, and I'll do my part. I said this to the committee. Um, I, I think Mindy and Bob can attest to it. When we met in November in, in, at the CFTC, I spoke briefly for about five or 10 minutes and left the room as they started their first meeting. And I told them that um, you know, I had did my part to sort of convene and to get the process going at the agency. I was now handing the ball off to them to to really do the work and, and fulfill that sort of vision that I had uh, laid out. Uh, and now the ball is in all of our courts, really, that we have to start to um, to advocate, to raise awareness, um, and to really push for change so that we can address this issue uh, as soon as possible. Great. Thank you, Commissioner. Bob, I'd love to move to you. What do you see as next steps now that um, you know, your your magnum opus is out. Thank you, Vina. And I, I guess to me, the, clearly the next step is we have to put a price on carbon. Incentives are so important. You know, uh, in a market economy, those of us in the financial markets, we see that when there's an opportunity, whether it's, you know, a basis point or two, investors are going to find out a way to take advantage of that. And, and if they can make profits, they're going to do whatever they need to to do that. So uh, these incentives are incredibly powerful. It's like gravity. You know, it, it's very hard to get off the ground when you've got gravity working against you. And similarly, right now, we have a fundamental flaw in the economy, which is that our incentives push capital in the wrong direction. And so we see emissions rising. Emissions are the flow into the atmosphere, and it's the stock of uh greenhouse gases that matter. So this is a system that has a lot of inertia. We should have addressed this problem, you know, decades ago, and it is extremely urgent that we address uh, these uh, incentives uh, immediately. I'm, I'm now the co-chair of the Climate Leadership Council, which is a bipartisan approach that has put together a carbon dividends plan that is supported by everyone from ExxonMobil on one side to the World Wildlife Fund on the other, and basically all of corporate America, all of the economics uh, profession, and uh, you know, <laughs> just about everyone you can imagine. And so we, we do have a problem of political inertia, and that has to be addressed immediately. And, and I, uh, you know, I can't uh, emphasize strongly enough how important it is that 
we uh, we take action. The the temperature going up, uh, you know, for a lifetime of my grandchildren. That's what they have to look forward to. We already have the wildfires. It's not going to get better on its own. It's only going to get better if we address it. Uh, we're probably going to have to suck, you know, every ton of carbon dioxide that goes into the atmosphere today out of the atmosphere at some point in the future to stabilize uh, this planet. So it's a huge liability that we're leaving for our kids. And uh, some of it's going to take decades to address. And, uh, and, you know, and some of it is extremely urgent. Uh, the way I talk about it is we've seen the danger now. Everyone's seen it. We all recognize it. There's, there's no one who is, uh, you know, looking at this and being honest who denies it. And, and so the question is, when are we going to act? And it's time to slam on the brakes right now. It's really what it is. And when I say the brakes, of course, I mean the incentive that we create to reduce emissions. We're, you know, and once we create that, it's a global problem. Once we create that, we're on our way to solving it. But right now, we still have that flaw in the economic system, and we've got to address it immediately. Uh, great. Thanks so much, Bob. And I think, Mindy, um, the last word goes to you. What's on the top of your wish list in terms of next steps? Now that you're well, uh, one is I support what my colleagues just said. Two is there are many things, but, but let me focus on one. Right now, the world is putting into the economy, dropping in money that never existed. Treasuries are writing those new dollars called stimulus bills to COVID. And, and we need to drop in money into the economy to help people who are suffering. That is not an insignificant. We expect to see about 10 to 12 trillion, not billion, but trillion dollars of new money that didn't exist four or five or six months ago. And maybe Bob could explain to me someday the real economics of how you make money come out of nowhere. But it's there, it's coming into our marketplace. That money could be spent in a way that locks us into a fossil fuel future, the future of the past, or it could be spent on a different future. Now, some of that money is going to go just keep businesses alive and human beings from starving, and it should. But there will be an enormous amount of money, whether it's a $2 trillion infrastructure bill that's being talked about for after the election in the United States, where we're building out our economy again. Do we build it around? fossil fuels and combustion engines? Do we build it around mass transit and, and life in the urban core? And what our communities look like and what kind of jobs we create in solar and wind and other renewable energy? So in addition to the kind of regulatory changes that we call for in the report, congressional legislative changes that Bob talks about as it relates to a price on carbon, which needs to be done in the United States as well as around the world where it hasn't been done. We need to collectively, every single one of us, make sure that that 10 or $12 trillion, even if it's half of that, is expended on a future that is about addressing climate change and building a future that's about a different kind of economy versus the kind of problems we've created for ourselves. It's not going to be easy, but when we get there, I don't think it will be hard. I think we will enjoy the life we created for our economy and for our people, uh, but we've got to dig in and we've got to come together and we've got to call on members of Congress and state legislatures keep meeting with the regulators to say climate risk is here, it's now, and we've got to act on it at all levels. Uh, great. And again, Minnie, this is really great segue to our audience questions, which are coming in sort of fast and furious. But the first question sort of relates to what we were just talking about, which is what will it get, what will it take to get financial regulators to act and implement these report recommendations? And specifically, is it going to need congressional intervention? So um, I'd love to maybe sort of get you your reaction to this, Commissioner, and then Bob and Mindy as well. I, I think, and Bob mentioned this earlier, um, and I sort of, I had, I, I understood this notion. There really isn't much authorization needed from Congress for the regulators to take action, specifically within the context of what the recommendations are in the policy report. Uh, of course, notwithstanding the carbon price, that has to get done by um, Congress. But, you know, really, Congress, regardless of whether or not Congress has to act, Congress is a huge part of this conversation. And Mindy mentioned 
um, the work that's being done by some members, both on the House side and the Senate side. But you're you're seeing oversight, you're seeing hearings, you're seeing different committees set up, informal committees set up to talk about the climate crisis, and then more importantly, to talk about climate as it relates to the economy and and um, financial markets. And I think, you know, I often say this: if you talk to if you picked 10 random people off the street and you talk to you ask them what do you think of when you when you hear climate change they talk about the environment they talk about energy production they talk about human health which is fine and they probably are the three most important things but as bob's mentioned minchie's men, mindy's mentioned this and that you know i've said it as well if you really think about the power of the financial markets and what the investor community can do and what financial markets can do if you have the incentives right um, that really can just sort of catapult this conversation. And I think while for decades now, I think DC has been focused on energy production and transitions to renewables, which is important again, um, and the human health element of, of climate change, which you, you know, you're seeing with obviously the forest fires, but also um, the hurricanes for the past you know, decades now, um, the financial markets have the power to sort of shift the conversation. And I think you're, you're seeing that inertia happen with Congress. So oversight is key. Um, I report to my authorizing committee uh, in Congress. So if if that committee wants me to do something, I am gonna do it. Um, that's why they put me here. Um, you know, I, they want me to be uh, have a forward thinking vision on what risks uh, our markets uh, face, and I do that, and I do my job on a day to day basis. But they also, you know, if they want something done, they have to write a letter and make a phone call, and it's gonna happen. So Congress plays a key role in this. Uh, with respect to the regulators themselves, I think. You know, you're seeing a lot of good work done at the, the Fed. San Francisco Fed specifically is doing a bit of research and some of the other regional Feds. Um, a number of, you know, Governor Brainerd's been talking about this as well. So I, I do think that you're starting to see a little bit of momentum. It's not enough. It needs to happen quicker. But um, that really is the impetus for this report, right? Let's, let's start to raise awareness, as I said, and have a, a hard conversation about what risks are there. And ultimately, my number one job, I'm not an elected official. Um, I'll be for the first to say that, but I'm a regulator. I was appointed by elected officials. And my number one job is to report to constituents and implement the law that Congress um, you know, puts before the Commodity uh, Futures Trading Commission. So I, I do those jobs, but I engage with stakeholders, whether it's the largest financial institutions or non-for-profits um, uh, or investors. And I have to hear them out. I have to see what's working, what's not working and really what they're seeing uh, on the playing field. And, and this report, I think, is proof that what they're seeing on the playing field are real risks uh, and real risks that they're thinking about, they have been for years, and that they're starting to address, but that they need help, they need um, coordination. And this is the, the, the sort of epitome of public-private partnership, right? This is not a regulator problem. This is not a private sector problem. This is a global problem. And we have to do it together. We have to do it thoughtfully. Uh, and we have to recognize the risks that are out there and we have to take a step uh, one at a time, but that's the only way it's going to get done. So um, I'm hopeful we'll get there. I'm going to do my end and sort of continue to work and advocate and uh, the authorities there, but we need everyone, everyone's hands on deck here and, and push the conversation forward. Great. Uh, Bob, Mindy, anything to add there? I think the commissioner uh, summarized it pretty well, but what I would, the one thing I would add is this is a risk management problem. You know, I've been dealing with risk management for decades now uh, on Wall Street and elsewhere. And, uh, you know, when you have a risk problem, you've got to, you've got to address it immediately. It, you know, it's not something that you can put off. And uh, I think the framing here of a risk committee and, you know, uh, managing the risk of the financial system and what we have to do. Uh, I was so glad when Commissioner Benham, you know, came to me a year ago and said, Bob, would you be willing to do this? Because, uh, you know, people haven't been willing to do this. We've got to step up. And, and the rest of the world, it is a global problem. So let's admit that. And the rest of the world is waiting for the U.S. You know, they've been addressing this in Europe for a while. Uh, the, you know, the Chinese now are in the middle of uh, developing their first federal, uh, you know, program to uh, reduce emissions. And, uh, and it's not at the level that it needs to be. None of these are globally. But until the U.S. gets involved, uh, you know, it's not going to happen. So very important that we take these steps and that we coordinate with uh, the Europeans and the Asian 
countries and uh, and get to a globally harmonized incentive that makes sense uh, to reduce emissions. And at that point, we'll be on the road to uh, ensuring uh, that our markets and our economies are safe. Uh, great, thank you, Bob. So uh, we're getting more questions more about the process. So one question we're getting is about the extent to which the administration, some of the regulators in question, like the SEC and Fed, were involved in the creation of this report. And uh, uh, a question that I'm gonna also throw into this mix is a, is a question likely for you, Bob, and, and you, Commissioner, about now that the report is done, what's gonna happen to the Climate Change Subcommittee? I, I can sort of take it from a process standpoint, unless, Bob, you wanna jump in, but, um, you know, I, I certainly talk with my, my fellow, uh, co my colleagues, my fellow regulators um, regularly on any number of issues. So. Um, going back now, almost a year and a half, I was certain to talk with them within the context of other issues that we talk about, about financial markets and, and our, our sort of day-to-day -day business. But I certainly um, shared with them what I was doing, why I was doing it, and sort of what my vision uh, and, and plan was. So I certainly appreciate their support throughout this process. Um, but this was a committee process. You know, the advisory committees are, in fact, just that. They are advisory committees to regulators. Um, so, you know, notwithstanding the formation and sort of setting the, the mandate and the charge and selecting the, the members, which obviously are very key components of this whole process, um, this was shepherded by Bob, uh, the members like Mindy and others and the editorial team to put together the report. We did have a comment period, which I thought was also important. Um, one thing I didn't mention, we put out the notice for members in July of 2019 and, um, you know, you you ask for members on an advisory committee, you might get 20 or 30 people, and typically they're DC-based sort of government advisors or government um, affairs folks who are great and they know their business well and they understand the intersection between policy and private uh, industry. But this was a pretty unique um, uh, outcome when we put that when I put that uh, that Federal Register notice that press release out back in July of 2019. We got nearly 90 responses and we got them from risk managers. We got them from commercial managers. We got them from folks um, in the industry who understood the risk, who understood how to manage the risk and, and really wanted to be a part of the conversation. With that said, I had to say no to almost you know uh, 50 some odd uh, individuals who uh, I had to cut down obviously and that was a hard decision to make and those were long hours thinking about who's gonna be on the committee but as a result of that, I thought it was important to have a public comment period a few months after the process had started. So I think in about April uh, or May even, we, we had issued out of the CFTC a public comment period and welcomed comment. And I know Bob and the editorial team um, did a really good job in sort of considering comments and integrating those into the report to the extent they were um, appropriate. And I was just gonna add, you know, we weren't uh, trying to create new science here or do our own investigation. We relied on uh, many reports uh, that are referenced in our report uh, that had previously been done uh, by various agencies of the US government as well as uh, uh, regulators around the world. And uh, so uh, our, our approach here was really to say, okay, what do we need to do? Given all this information, given this expertise, and we had an awful lot of expertise on the uh, on the subcommittee, uh, so you know we did take a lot of input. Uh, but really, what we were focused on is what needs to be done. Um, great. So we are getting a few questions about you know issues or topics that the report considers. So I'm going to bunch a couple of them together and potentially. Um, have you take the first stab in answering this, Bob? So to what extent does the report consider the issue of just transition clearly particularly relevant given today's ongoing conversations about racial justice? Sort of the second question is to what extent does the report sort of equally consider not just transition risks, but also the exacerbating physical risks associated with climate change? Okay, well, the second one is easy. We did take into account both transition risk and physical risks, and we tried to see, think broadly about how you know these could interact and it's not one event that we're worried about but it could be you know multiple events as we're seeing this year uh you know in the same period of time or it could be multiple events happening over and over and it could be not only systemic risk to the whole economy but also 
subsystemic risk to a particular region, or you know, in which case banks in that region may be uh, impacted more uh, broadly. But uh, it's uh, it's something that uh, we're you, you, you know we don't know exactly what's going to happen. We have to think about the full range of potential outcomes. And it being a risk committee that really focused our attention there. Now you raise the issue of uh, justice and uh, impacts. And let me say that for sure, the impacts are not going to be equally spread. There's going to be you know, primary impacts on marginalized and low-income communities. And we know that. And we've seen that anytime we have these kinds of impacts. Uh, that's who gets hurt the most. Now, our committee was a risk committee. So we focused primarily on risk and financial risk. We, we were talking about protecting uh, the financial markets and the financial system. And obviously we all depend on that. So it impacts everybody. And we do take into account, and we mention uh, multiple places in the report that when you address climate change and climate risk, uh, so for instance, if you impose a, uh, a price on carbon, uh, there's gonna be impacts and you have to address those impacts and you have to make sure that uh, you know, it doesn't impact overly those who are low income or in marginalized communities. And so we do recognize that, we take it into account, but I would also emphasize that our focus was absolutely risk management and not, you know, the broader uh, problems that face society. Oh, great. Thank you, Bob. Um, I've seen a couple of questions come in about TCFD reporting and the importance of data to really under, underpin sort of informed decisions that companies and investors need to make around climate risk. So let me sort of frame that as a little bit of a broader conversation. Um, Commissioner Yu and, and Mindy as well had talked about the, the, you know, the call for climate change disclosure in this report. So what do you see as the connection between climate change disclosure and this broader conversation that we're having about sort of systemic risk and the role of financial regulators? I'll be brief and let Mindy uh, take a stab at this too. But you know, when I think about disclosures, it's just it's information, right? Like we're, we can all make better decisions and more informed decisions if we have better and more information, and that's just the bottom line. So we can couch it however we want, and we can frame it however we want within our financial circles and our financial regulatory regime, and this and that. Whether it's a 10K or a Q, or it's a reporting requirement from a swap dealer at the CFTC. But the bottom line is we need more information. And TCFD has done an amazing job. I applaud all the members of TSC, TCFD, the FSB, obviously, Mayor Bloomberg, Randy Quarles. I mean, there's a number of people who got that really going and moved it forward. Uh, but there are some statistics about uh, the, the recommendations from TCFD that you know still demand more work. I mean, how many people are implementing them? They're voluntary. Um, there's been a lot of good work, but this is where I really think it's important to have a public-private partnership because as much as I think, and I see this a lot in the regulatory space, the largest, most sophisticated institutions have resources, they have personnel, and they have sophisticated risk managers, uh, like guys like Bob, who are able to really see and, uh, and uh, sort of digest the full scope of issues that an institution faces. But we have small and medium-sized institutions or even some large institutions who are not bought into this. And that's where I think the net has to be cast a little wider um, so that we have a full sort of team effort because that's what it's going to require. Uh, and then on the TCFD front and sort of just how do we get um, a streamlined, mandatory, standardized disclosure regime, um, you really need to have, in my view, a public-private partnership because those are the issues that we're hearing from the investor community, from the regulatory community, that there are different matrices, there are different standards. Um, what are the reporting requirements necessarily going to be? And you know, I again, I don't want to uh, at all uh, undermine the efforts. I actually just want to applaud them because they have, in part, driven this conversation and the reason we're here today. Um, that was a huge motivating factor for what I did and why I did it because of that work from the private sector. Um, the private sector plays a key role in this. I mean, their their understanding and appreciation of these risks is huge, but there is a place for the public sector. You know, we're seeing that with COVID. I mean, this is a this is a problem, a, a, a cooperative problem that we need to respond collectively to. Uh, and we saw that with COVID. We're seeing it with COVID. We need to be better prepared. We need to have better information. We need to trust science. 
Uh, and I think that's what climate really is presenting to us. And I think within the context of disclosures, um, we as the regulatory community, and I think we collectively as the financial markets community need to work off of what TCFD has done, the good work they've done, uh, and just you know build it up more. Um, Mindy? Yeah, so I would just briefly add, what this report helps to do is move climate risk information from the nice to have to the must have. It affirms that climate risk is a material financial risk, like currency risk and trade risk and inflation risk and other risks, and it ought to be dealt with the same seriousness, meaning disclosing the risk ought to be mandatory because it's a material risk. It is big enough that investors need that information. It is the job of regulators, in the case of the Securities and Exchange Commission, to mandate the disclosure of material risk information. We are living that risk. We are living it in California today and what's gonna happen with the storms. There's gonna be more billion dollar storms than we've ever could have imagined. That's no longer little risk, not that there's such a term. It is a material financial risk. And the report gives it the credibility that affirms the materiality of that risk and the need to disclose it. Because when you have information in the marketplace, you make better decisions. If you don't know what's going on, you're making decisions in the absence of real data. So this report builds upon the need, whether it's TCFD or any other reporting structure, the need for reports, the need for data, and the need for it to be mandatory so it could be comparable and all institutions are putting out the same type of information and investors can certainly act based on that. Okay. And, a, and a foundation on good climate change disclosure is also needed to get financial regulators to do the assessment on impacts on their mandate as well. So this is extremely helpful. So a huge thanks to Commissioner Benham, um, to Bob, to Mindy for both your leadership as a part of the, the, the climate change subcommittee and the creation of this report, as well as your time today. We have many, many, many questions that we did not unfortunately have a chance to get to, but that I think hopefully this is just the beginning of a conversation and there will be many more opportunities to engage. So as a part of our follow-up from this report, we will be sending both a link to this webinar, as well as a link to the, the CFTC climate change report. I'm not even gonna pretend to say the name, but it's very long, um, as well as a link to a sign-on letter that CVS had organized, essentially calling financial regulatory um, leadership attention to the systemic nature of climate change um, and calling on them to take action. So you should be receiving all of this information um, in an email that should come through, we hope, sometime today. With that, um, thank you very much for your enthusiastic participation in this web webinar. Thanks again to our speakers. And I hope all of you have a really great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.